So now up to now, we have discussed the normal breakdown of red blood cell and what happened to the red blood cell breakdown components. Is that right? Now we will start discussing some points related with hemolytic anemia. What we are going to discuss now, the topic is hemolytic anemia. Now, as I told you in previous lecture, that normally red blood cells survive about 120, 120 days. But if red blood cells start breaking down, prematurely. If red blood cells start breaking down prematurely, for example, red blood cells start undergoing hemolysis or breakdown when they are just 50 days old or 60 days old, we call the process hemolysis. What is hemolysis? Breakdown of red blood cells prematurely. But when red blood cells break down after about 120 days, that is normal breakdown of red blood cells. That is called physiological breakdown of red blood cells. When red blood cells start breaking down in our body prematurely before 120 days, right, we say what is the problem going on in our body is hemolysis. Is that right? That is called hemolysis. Now, let us suppose we have a patient in which red blood cells are very rapidly being destroyed. For example, I'm a patient and I have a disease in which red blood cells are not surviving for 120 days. Rather, in my case, if my red blood cells are surviving only 20 days, every red blood cell which is produced on average after 20 days, it is destroyed. It means rate of destruction is six times. Right? Normal rate of destruction is 120 days. 120 days. But if my red blood cells are rapidly destroyed and they are destroying at 20 days, actually 120 by 6 is equal to 20 days. It means in a person, when red blood cells are destroyed rapidly and their life is only 20 days, it means hemolysis is accelerated. It is increased how many times? Six, Six times. Time. Now, when RBCs are rapidly being destroyed, when red blood cells are rapidly being destroyed, there is a tendency that hemoglobin levels start coming down. And when hemoglobin level goes a little down, then oxygen transport to kidney is slightly reduced. In response to reduced supply of oxygen to the kidney, kidney produces a substance called erythropoietin. Kidney produces a substance to the blood called erythropoietin. Poetin. Right? Now again, whenever, whatever the reason, if oxygen supply to your kidney is reduced, kidney start producing a hormone in extra amount and that hormone is erythropoietin. So it means that patient's level of erythropoietin will go up in the blood. Is that right? Which part of the kidney produces the erythropoietin? Who will tell me? Which part of the kidney produces erythropoietin? Not the it is not medulla. It's not the endothelial cell of the vas rectum. Let me tell you exactly where it is. You are very near. You are very right. These are endothelial cells, but not of vasa recta. Let me tell you. Who will tell me that where the erythropoietin is produced? Yeah? Principal cells? Very bad. Principal cells are here. Principal cells are here. They don't produce erythropoietin. They are actually acted upon by aldosterone. And they are acted upon by antidiuretic hormone. But they are not producing a hormone. Right? Uh, he's right partly that around this proximal convoluted tubular cells, around the proximal convoluted tubular cells, uh, there are special type of capillaries, which is called peritubular capillaries. There are special type of capillaries here, which are called, which capillaries? Peri, this is proximal convoluted tube. Around this tube, there are capillary network. This is called peritubular capillaries, right? Actually, endothelial cells of peritubular capillaries, these are the endothelial cells. Endothelial cells of peritubular capillaries and connective tissue cells outside the peritubular capillaries. 
they are very very sensitive to oxygen what happens that you know there's a lot of oxygen utilized by proximal convoluted tubular cells and distal convoluted tubular cells so when oxygen supply become less here and oxygen supply become less here these cell activate special genes and those genes make messenger RNA and that messenger RNA is translated into erythropoietin and then erythropoietin is released into circulation right this erythropoietin once its level goes up erythropoietin has its receptors has its receptors on pro erythroblast and erythroblast these cells the bone marrow where red blood cells are being produced the precursors of red blood cells are having receptors for erythroblast so this sorry receptors for erythropoietin so this erythropoietin which is produced by the kidney it is carried by the blood to the bone marrow and then erythropoietin will bind here when erythropoietin will bind with the receptors on pro erythroblast and erythroblast what will happen to erythroblast and pro erythroblast what is the function of erythropoietin they increase the number of yeah but how I'm about to be impressed by someone. Increase the activity of the stem cell? Uh, yeah, no, they don't work on stem cell in the beginning. They work on stem cell, the hair, for example, pluripotent stem cell. They work on specially erythroid line, right? In the erythroid line on the precursor cells, uh, they bind with their receptors. And their receptors give signal into cell. Let me tell you exactly what, you are right that when erythropoietin goes there, erythropoiesis become more and more RBCs are produced. This is a very good answer, but an excellent answer that at molecular level, what erythropoietin is doing. Actually, if you take some erythroblast, some cell from the bone marrow, put into petri dish in the, in the laboratory, you provide them all the nutrition, still they will automatically die. These cells have a tendency of suicide. They kill themselves. This cellular suicide is called process of apoptosis. Some people call it apoptosis, but one P is silent, right? So we call it apoptosis. So these cells have a natural tendency of apoptosis. They undergo death. But if they are alive, they keep on multiplying. Now, what erythropoietin is doing? It is the message of life. When erythropoietin come and bind with these receptors, these receptors give signal and stop the apoptotic process. So basically, erythropoietin is anti-apoptotic hormone for pro-erythroblast. When they don't die, then they naturally multiply and produce more red blood cells. Is that right? So that is exactly what erythropoietin is doing in the bone marrow. It is maintaining the and does not allow the precursor cell of erythroid series to undergo apoptosis. Am I clear? Yes, you want to ask something. Yeah, we'll talk about that later. Yes, he's right. That actually, you want to know that this will give signals inside and it will be inhibiting the pro-apoptotic genes, which are, P, uh, which are bad, BACs and P53, and it will be stimulating anti-apoptotic genes, which are BCL2, BCL6, but right now we should not indulge into that discussion. Let's concentrate. This is enough for right now. The erythropoietin comes, bind with the erythroblast, and don't allow them to be apoptotic and they survive for longer time and multiply for longer time. And erythropoietic process become fast, and more and more red blood cells are produced. And you know that bone marrow, which is producing the red blood cells, or bone marrow which is having erythroid activity, or the bone marrow which is actively multiplying and producing blood cell, such bone marrow is called red bone marrow. So in the presence of erythropoietin, red bone marrow enlarges. The amount of red bone marrow in our marrow spaces become more. So erythropoietin increases the amount of red bone marrow and our bone marrow become hypercellular because cells are not dying. So they, will, they remain alive for longer time and multiply more fastly and bone marrow become very rich into these erythroid cells. Our bone marrow become very rich in those cells which produce red blood cells. Due to this reason, we say that patient's bone marrow is having, person's bone marrow is having erythroid hyperplasia. Hyperplasia means cells are increased in number due to increased multiplication. Erythroid means those cells which produce the red blood cells. So bone marrow of this person who is having hemolysis, when there is excessive breakdown of red blood cells, right, uh, 
uh, erythropoietin level in the blood start going up, erythropoietin produces erythroid hyperplasia and bone marrow become very very rich in precursor cells and red blood cells are produced slowly or fastly now? Fastly. Is that right? Red blood cells are produced more fastly. Now listen, as red blood cells are coming here more rapidly, right? So we say bone marrow is reacting to hemolysis because red blood cells were very rapidly destroyed. Oxygen supply to the oxy uh, kidney slightly reduced produces extra amount of erythropoietin which increases the erythropoietic activity and bone marrow is reacting to react bone marrow is trying to compensate for excessive loss of red blood cells. Now, normally your bone marrow, if it is your healthy bone marrow and it has enough vitamins, enough iron and enough other nutrients, then bone marrow can increase its erythropoietic activity up to how much? It, is, it can be increasing its act in healthy person's bone marrow. Uh, it can increase its rate of production of red blood cells up to 10 times. 8 to 10 times it can increase its red cell production. If bone marrow is healthy and it is provided enough iron, enough B12, enough folic acid and enough other components. Is that right? So it means our bone marrow has a reserve power that it can increase its production of red blood cells. Claro? Clear? Now, I said that in this patient, red blood cells were being destroyed very rapidly. Rather than 120 days, they were surviving only for 20 days. So we say hemolysis was increased six times. Hemolysis was increased six times. But at the same time, if erythropoiesis is also increased six times, then what will happen? That in spite of the fact the red blood cells are very rapidly destroyed, uh, hemoglobin concentration will be still maintained. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So whenever bone marrow has a capability of compensating for the ex ex accelerated what? Hemolysis. Hemolysis and it can do accelerated erythropoiesis, then we will say, yes, patient has compensated hemolytic no anemia because hemoglobin is not down. We will say patient has compensated hemolytic disease. Compensated hemolytic disease because in this person destruction of red blood is more than six times. So hemolysis is going on. But bone marrow is compensating. So there is a disease. There is an extra hemolysis. But bone marrow is compensated well. So uh, total red cell mass and hemoglobin concentration is not significantly going down. So we call this condition what? Hemolytic compensated, compensated hemolytic disease. disease, not anemia. Is that right? Now you imagine, if I have some other disease or the same disease become more aggressive and destroy my RBC very rapidly and my red blood cells lifetime, for example, destruction of red blood cells become 10 times more, right? And now they are surviving only for? Or 12 times more destruction and red blood cell life is only 10 days. 10 days. Now still bone marrow, if it is having all the important elements, it will produce. But if bone marrow cannot accelerate its erythropoiesis so much that it cannot compensate, that it cannot compensate for the losses, losses which are going on, then we say progressively hemoglobin level will start going yeah. down. Yeah. Then we'll say hemolysis is now producing anemia. And now we'll say patient has hemolytic anemia. So from today onward, you have to remember every patient who has a hemolysis, accelerated hemolysis, is not having anemia. Because in many patients, when hemolysis is going on, bone marrow upgra upgrades its production. So hemolysis is there, but if bone marrow is compensating, it's just like that. What? That in your home, lot of lot of guests come and they're eating on the dining table. But if you increase the kitchen supply, right? You, everything is eaten fastly, but if your supplies are good, there's no problem. Problem will really come when there are so many guests that you cannot compensate for the food. Is that right? So what is the difference in number one? There is normal physiological red uh, breakdown of red blood cells. Is that right? We discussed in the first part of the lecture. 
Then we talk about in some diseases, red blood cells are prematurely dying before 120 days. We say there is hemolysis going on. Then what happens that usually bone marrow, when hemolysis starts going on, in the blood erythropoietin level go up and it forces the bone marrow to compensate for the losses. Bone marrow reacts, right? Bone marrow production goes up. And if rate of destruction of RBCs and production of RBCs remain into balance, we say hemolysis is there, but anemia is not there. Then we call it compensated, compensated hemolytic disease. But if rate of hemolysis becomes so much that bone marrow cannot compensate and hemoglobin and red cell mass start going down, we say now patient has anemia due to hemolysis or simply hemolytic anemia. Now sometimes what happens that hemolysis is increased only four times. For example, there is a patient in which hemolysis is increased four times rather than 120 days, RBC life is only 30 days. So they are surviving only for one fourth of the time, four time increase hemolysis. Normally bone marrow can increase four time erythropoiesis. But if there is iron deficiency or there is B12 deficiency or there is folic acid deficiency or there is some other disease related with problem related with the bone marrow and if it cannot even double its supply, still hemolytic anemia will occur. You could not understand. Let me tell you. I, I told you healthy bone marrow, which is having good supply of the nutrient, can increase its erythropoiesis up to 8 to 10 times. Right? It means even very severe hemolysis will be compensated by bone marrow. If bone marrow is healthy and having good iron, because to make more RBCs you need iron, you need B12, you need folic acid. Is that right? If you are having all these good supply. Hello? Now, I'm saying, let us suppose in one person, bone marrow is does not have a capacity to multiply too much its production. For example, there is iron deficiency, mm -hmm. or there is B12 deficiency, or there is folic acid deficiency, or there is radioactivity has destroyed some part of bone marrow, or some other disease that destroyed some part of bone marrow, and total bone marrow is less. Now, under these circumstances, if there is some other disease which is producing hemolysis, if RBC's lifespan is reduced from 120 days to 30 days, to 30 days and 30 days, right? So we say there's four time increase in red blood cell destruction. Is that right? But normally healthy bone marrow can compensate that. And we say patient has compensated hemolytic disease. But if bone marrow cannot produce at the four time production of red blood cell, Maybe it only doubles this red blood cell production and destruction is four times and production is double, still red blood cell will go down and hemolytic anemia will be there. The point which I want to put in your mind that when a patient comes and you are suspecting hemolytic anemia, you have to look at the both balance sheet. That what is the rate of destruction of red blood cell and what is the rate of erythroid compensation? So it means when a patient comes, when you are thinking your patient has hemolytic anemia, then you have to look in the patient what is the evidence of excessive breakdown. And you must look in the patient what is the evidences of bone marrow compensation. Now let's talk about those things. That when a patient comes to you and you are thinking that patient has anemia and you may think that anemia is due to hemolysis, first you have to confirm is there hemolysis or not. Is that right? So when a patient comes, to you and you are suspecting that there is hemolytic anemia, first you have to answer a question. What is that question? Is there hemolysis or not? Is there any evidence of hemolysis or not? Now, how do we answer that our patient is having hemolysis or not? Let's try to answer here. You know when normally red blood cells break down, what they produce here? Bilirubin. Yes? Bilirubin. When if there is hemolysis and there is too much ex extra destruction of red blood cell, then bilirubin will be less or more? More. more? more. So what happens? If you say your patient has hemolysis or hemolytic anemia, then RBCs must be destroying at faster rate and breakdown product of hemoglobin, that is bilirubin, should be at higher production. Yes. So this bilirubin level in the blood will go? Up. Up. What is this bilirubin? Conjugated, unconjugated? Unconjugated. This is? 
unconjugated. So in these patients who have too much hemolysis, unconjugated bilirubin level in their blood goes up. And we say that they have unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. What is it? Should I write it here? Unconjugated hyper Billy Ruby Nemia. That bilirubin level in the blood is high. There's hyperbilirubinemia. But what kind of bilirubin is high? Unconjugated. So they have unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. And when bilirubin level in the blood goes high, it gives a yellow color to your skin, mucous membrane, and sclera. And this condition is called jaundice. jaundice. This is called jaundice. So these patients who have hemolysis, they may develop hemolytic jaundice. Jaundice due to hemolysis. Why hemolytic jaundice develop? Because due to excessive hemolysis, more unconjugated bilirubin is produced and it is accumulating in the blood and then it imparts yellow coloration to the skin and mucous membrane and sclera. So they develop unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia or hemolytic jaundice. But one thing is very important. Usually, in patient with hemolytic hemolysis, hemolytic jaundice is very mild. It is not very severe jaundice. Bilirubin levels never go very high. Why? Because normally liver has reserve function. So when bilirubin levels are extra amount of bilirubin are produced, liver has a capacity to uptake extra bilirubin, conjugate extra bilirubin, and secrete extra bil conjugated bilirubin into urine. So normally our liver has capability to handle extra amount of bilirubin. Due to this reason, when hemolysis is red cell breakdown is rapid, then bilirubin production is rapid. And when bilirubin production is rapid, usually if your liver is healthy, it, it increases its handling of and disposal of bilirubin. Due to this reason, most of extra bilirubin goes out of the body and in the blood, bilirubin accumulation is mild, not severe. That is why if a patient comes who has hemolytic jaundice and if jaundice is very severe, there must be some other cause of jaundice also. Or maybe his liver is not cooperating well. Usually, if you have pure hemolysis and hemolysis is producing unconjugated bilirubin, unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia is usually mild to moderate. It can never be severe until liver is functioning well. Am I clear? Mm -hmm. There is no problem? Okay. This is one thing. So, our first evidence of hemolysis is, is jaundice. What is first evidence? Yes, please. Jaundice. That is jaundice. So, if you have, you think your patient has very severe hemolysis, he should have unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia in the blood test and have a little jaundice there. Is that right? Another interesting thing, because if anemia also occurs, anemia makes the skin which color? Anemia, when hemoglobin less, it makes the skin pale. No. Anemia makes the skin pale. P-A-L-E. Pale. And jaundice makes the skin yellow. And if a patient has hemolytic anemia and jaundice, this pale color of anemia and pale color of anemia and yellow color of jaundice, they mix together and they give a color to the skin which is called lemon yellow color. So your patient may develop lemon yellow color. Is that right? Am I clear? Right? This is a combination of the skin color due to anemia and... Right. We will continue the lecture, right? Now... This is first evidence that patient has unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia and, of course, jaundice with unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Is that right? This is evidence number one. Second evidence that hemolysis is going on. There's another evidence in the body that red blood cells are breaking. What is that? Again, come back. Not only bilirubin is high, not only there is jaundice. Look, look. Is unconjugated bilirubin is going to the liver in smaller amount or larger amount? Larger, larger, amount. larger amount when there is hemolysis. So conjugated bilirubin is being produced in larger amount. So in the when very large amount of conjugated bilirubin come into GIT, it produces larger amount of stercobilin. 
so stool will become dark color so in these patients stool become dark color jaundice with a stool which is which color dark color so in hemolytic jaundice uh, there is excessive amount of stercobalinogen and usually patient has darker color stool another thing when there is excessive high amount of conjugated bilirubin coming here then this urobalinogen which is absorbed is less than normal or more than normal more than normal. more than normal so larger amount of urobalinogen will be going to the blood and from there it will be going into urine so urine will have extra amount of what extra amount of urobilinogen and this is so whenever your urine has extra amount of high amount of urobilinogen it means rbc is breaking down fastly because when unconjugate sorry when in the urine urobilinogen become high when rbc is breaking fastly there's more unconjugated bilirubin in the blood more unconjugated bilirubin is converted into more conjugated bilirubin and more conjugated bilirubin convert into more urobalinogen and stercobalinogen stool become darker color and urobalinogen some of it which goes into the urine that is more than normal concentration so in these patient another evidence of hemolysis is yes please what is the next evidence of hemolysis increased urobilin in urine and of course dark color stool dark stool fecal matter is dark yeah now i knew there will be some intelligent person who will ask what will happen to the color of urine we have already said the color of the stool will be very dark due to high concentration of stercobalinogen what will happen to the color of the urine it's going to be darker why because of high concentration of urobilin okay uh, there are two things in the blood number one blood has in this patient blood has more urobilinogen number two blood has more unconjugated bilirubin yes. right do you think bilirubin in urine gives dark color or urobilinogen give dark color answer is bilirubin urobilinogen no, does no, not no, no. just a minute urobilinogen is not a very strong pigment so it may make the urine dark but very little is that right very little what thing can really make the urine dark is when bilirubin itself appear into urine listen carefully which pro breakdown product of the hemoglobin can make the urine dark right is when bilirubin itself come into urine, urine. now listen carefully unconjugated bilirubin is strongly bound with plasma protein and this complex is very large and it cannot leak into urine okay. so in this case patient has jaundice patient has unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia but normally unconjugated plasma protein bound bilirubin does not appear into urine is that right so urine does not become significantly dark is that right and this is a jaundice in which bilirubin is not present in urine this this type of jaundice is also given another very special name that is jaundice in which bilirubin is not in urine we call this type of jaundice a call uric jaundice a call call mean bile call mean here bilirubin a call that bilirubin is not there right and a coal uric in the urine, urine bile uh, bilirubin is not there but patient has jaundice so a coal uric jaundice is a type of jaundice in which bilirubin is not leaking into urine in which bilirubin is not leaking into urine, urine. it is usually unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia am i clear is that right so in hemolytic disease what type of jaundice is there a coal uric jaundice what type of hyperbilirubinemia is there unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia which breakdown product is increased into urine is urobilinogen and of course urobilinogen is not bilirubin is that right now but just by the way i should mention if there is some obstruction here let us suppose there is a cancer here or there is a gallstone here 
it means there is obstruction here if there is some other patient who has obstruction here can conjugated bilirubin go down no, no. no. now conjugated bilirubin will fall into blood and conjugated bilirubin will accumulate in the blood and go up this type of jaundice is called this is a jaundice which is due to conjugated hyperbilirubinemia when there is obstruction here and bilirubin can come here get conjugated but cannot go down and it accumulate here and fall back blood develop hyperbilirubinemia high level of bilirubin but what bilirubin is there unconjugated or conjugated, conjugated. so patient develop conjugated hyperbilirubinemia conjugated bilirubin can appear into urine and urine become very dark and urine become very dark, very dark. i wanted to make that confusion clear so when you have conjugated when you have obstruction here then you have conjugated hyperbilirubinemia then you have cold uric jaundice cold uric jaundice is that right? Not a cold uric jaundice. Cold uric jaundice. In the urine there is bilirubin. And in this particular case, when bilirubin is going into urine, urine become dark colored. And when block is here, do you think there is any conjugated bilirubin coming here? No. no. Do you think you are getting stercobalinogen? No. So light color store. Light color fecal matter. So if you have a patient which has dark patient with jaundice, if you have a patient with jaundice with dark urine and light stool dark urine and light stool if you check his urine for urobilinogen in this patient where there is obstruction here do you think any urobilinogen is formed no if there is obstruction here there is no urobilinogen can urobilinogen go into urine yes no if block is here if block is here is that right what is happening that conjugated bilirubin is going back to the blood, not going here. So it is not changed into stercobalinogen. So stool remains light colored and urobalinogen is not produced. So in the urine there is no urobalinogen. So actually, whenever you have a patient of jaundice in which urine is dark colored due to conjugated bilirubin urea and stool is light colored and urobalinogen is not there, this is obstructive jaundice. This is obstructive jaundice there is obstruction to the bile outflow and whenever you produce obstruction here not only conjugated bilirubin go back but with that bile acids also go back you know in the liver in the bile there are bile acids from here conjugated bilirubin is going down as well as bile acids and bile salt are going down when there is obstructive jaundice obstruction is here by not only conjugated bilirubin fall here but along with that bile acids come here bile acids when they come into blood they go under the skin and irritate the mast cells and produce itching they produce itching so there is a clinical saying when your patient of jaundice has dark urine light stool with itching it is obstructive jaundice until proved otherwise am i clear this clinical point is clear to you right but anyway we went away to the obstructive jaundice because i wanted to make your concept clear let's come back to hemolysis so what were the evidences of that our patient is having hemolysis? One evidence, patient has a jaundice. What type of jaundice? Unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Number two, there is increased urobalinogen. Number three, stool is dark color. But urine is not dark color. Is that right? But urine has extra amount of urobalinogen. Is there any other evidence of hemolysis? If my unconjugated bilirubin is high, there's more urobalinogen in the urine, more stercobalinogen in the fecal matter. It's all telling that there is hemolysis going on. Any other evidence of hemolysis? Yes. When red blood cell break down, they release enzymes. There is an enzyme which is present in red blood cell. That enzyme is called LDH. This enzyme can be, can be released by injury to many tissues. Many tissues in our body have LDH, but if other tissue do not have any injury, uh, then in the blood, if LDH level go up, LDH means lactate dehydrogenase enzyme. This is present in the red blood cells. If there is too much excessive breakdown of red blood cells, then in the blood, LDH level will also go up. Right? That is another evidence of hemolysis. The red blood cells are breaking down excessively. So how many evidences of hemolysis? Unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, then there is increased urobalinogen 
and then there is dark stool and then there is in the blood level of LDH increased. Can there be an other evidence of hemolysis? When red blood cells are very rapidly breaking down, some other change in the body. Anyone please? Listen, liver produces another special type of protein, liver cells release into circulation and this protein is this protein. This protein is called, yes, what is the name of this protein? Hepto, heptoglobin. This is a normal protein which is produced by your liver and it is right now normally circulating in your blood. What is the name of this protein? Heptoglobin. Is that right? Now, normally our blood has a good level of heptoglobin. What is the function of heptoglobin? Actually, heptoglobin bind with the free hemoglobin. If due to some reason, some free hemoglobin come into blood, for example, if a hemoglobin molecule, let us suppose this is a red blood cell, it breaks down into blood. Normally, red blood cells break down into macrophages. But if red blood cell undergoes hemolysis within circulation, some hemoglobin is released free. Hemoglobin is highly toxic molecule. It damages especially kidneys. I will talk about that later. So nature has pro provided some backup protection that if hemoglobin become into circulation, heptoglobin will immediately bind the hemoglobin. So heptoglobin is free hemoglobin binding protein. What is heptoglobin? Free hemoglobin, free hemoglobin binding protein. protein. When heptoglobin bind with the free hemoglobin, this complex is very rapidly eaten up by macrophages. And when hemoglobin bind with heptoglobin, it cannot damage our tissue. But macrophages very rapidly and liver cells very rapidly take up the hemoglobin heptoglobin complex and destroy hemoglobin and heptoglobin. So, when there is hemolysis going on and if there is free hemoglobin coming into blood, then it will complex with heptoglobin and free heptoglobin levels will go down. Are you with me? So what happens? Another evidence of hemolysis is, yes, reduced free heptoglobin levels in blood. When someone blood has less than normal heptoglobin, you must think of Hemolysis. hemolysis. Now another thing. Hemolysis can occur within the macrophages, which is called extravascular hemolysis, or hemolysis can occur within the circulation. When hemolysis occur within the macrophages, when hemolysis occur within the macrophages, then most of the hemoglobin is destroyed within macrophage. Very little hemoglobin come out. So when there is extravascular hemolysis, very little hemoglobin leak into circulation and heptoglobin level go slightly down. But if there is intravascular hemolysis, heptoglobin level goes severely down or even almost disappear from the patient blood. So this is a very important point. At heptoglobin level are slightly less, you think hemolysis is going within the Macrophage. macrophages. But if heptoglobin level almost disappear from the blood, it means hemolysis is within the general circulation, intravascular hemolysis. Is that right? So all these are the evidence of hemolysis. So if your patient is having unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia, increased urobilin stool in the history is dark, LDH in the blood is high, hepatoglobin, heptoglobin, heptoglobin is low, it means yes, hemolysis is going on. The next important work of a doctor is, now he should look for evidence that if hemolysis is going on, is bone marrow trying to compensate or not? Is bone marrow is reactive or not? Because the normal response of bone marrow under these circumstances should be that it should produce extra red blood cell. There should be evidence of accelerated erythropoiesis. There should be evidence of accelerated erythropoiesis. There must be evidence of bone marrow reaction to this situation. So let's look for those evidences. Second question which you have to ask yourself is, does my patient have accelerated, yes, erythro, yes, erythro, 
poesis or not. Now, what are the evidences that your patient has accelerated erythropoiesis or not? Very simple. Number one. Whenever bone marrow increases its erythropoietic activity, in the blood, percentage of fresh RBCs will decrease or increase. Listen. Whenever bone marrow is producing very rapidly erythropoiesis, it is making a lot of RBCs very rapidly. Then in the blood, percentage of fresh RBCs will be less than normal or more than normal? More than normal. Fresh RBCs are called reticulocytes. Fresh RBCs are called reticulocytes. Now what is reticulocyte? It is newly released red blood cell, right? Or we call it immature red blood cell. We call it new red blood cell. Actually, new red blood cell, it is slightly larger than normal red blood cell. Suppose this is reticulocyte and here I am going to make normal red blood cell. Reticulocyte is slightly larger. Mature red blood cell is slightly smaller. It is 8 to 9 micron. It is 7 to 8 micron. Number 2, it is slightly larger. Number 2, newly released red blood cell has some, it has a lot of hemoglobin, but suppose this is hemoglobin, okay. Newly released red blood cell has hemoglobin, but hemoglobin is also present in mature red blood cell. The difference is that newly released red blood cell is still synthesizing hemoglobin. It is still synthesizing, synthesizing hemoglobin and it still has some messenger RNA and some ribosomes. Some messenger RNA and some ribosome because it is still doing the production of hemoglobin. When with special stain, we call them supraviolet stain or new methylene blue stain. When those stains are applied, these this RNA and ribosomes, they are stained as blue network. And these are new red blood cells which have a blue network in them. Because they have a network of RNA and ribosome, we call, network mean retic. So we call them reticulocyte, the cells with net blue network. Is that right? So when these reticulocytes appear into circulation, within one or two days, all this RNA and ribosomes are disintegrated and they convert into mature red blood cells, which is well hemoglobinized. So they have slightly blue color, slightly bluish red color and mature red cell has red color. Reticulocyte is slightly larger and mature red cell is slightly smaller. Now, in normal person, when you have normal erythropoiesis, normal erythropoiesis, in the peripheral circulation, 1 to 2 percent of the red blood cells are reticulocyte. In, for example, if I am having right now normal erythropoiesis, then in my, uh, if you look at my red blood cells, Micro, under the microscope, 1 to 2 percent of the red blood cell will be actually reticulocyte. Is that right? But if it is producing too much reticulocytes very rapidly, maybe up to 10 percent, 20 percent of the red blood cell will be retics. It means reticulocyte percentage in the blood and reticulocyte count in the blood will go up. So first evidence that bone marrow is really compensating is reticulocytosis. Reti Reticulocytosis means that patient has increased reticulocyte count. If someone has not, he is having severe hemolysis, but not retic increased reticulocyte count, it means there are double problem. One problem is RBCs are rapidly destroyed. Second problem, bone marrow is not responding. Is that right? This person will develop very rapid anemia. Am I clear? So normally, there should be evidences of bone marrow or increased like accelerated erythropoiesis. Number one, reticulocyte in the blood will go down, up. Reticulocyte count will go up. Number two, mean corpuscular volume. The, you know, red blood cells have their size. In the previous lectures, I told you mean corpuscular volume. The volume of one red blood cell, not the size, I'm talking about volume. Volume of one red blood cell is somewhere between 80 to 100 femtoliter. It's a very small size of the red blood cell. Healthy red blood cell has its size somewhere between 80 to 100 femtoliter. 
right now listen if bone marrow is doing very rapid erythropoiesis lot of reticulocyte and fresh red blood cells are coming into circulation then average mean or average volume of red blood cell will go down or up up, up. so mean corpuscular volume will go up because percentage of reticulocyte goes up so we say mean corpuscular volume may be somewhere around 105 femtoliter if you want you if you do not want to remember this you simply say that the patients who have hemolysis severe initially their red blood cells are of normal size but as more and more fresh red blood cells are coming or reticulocytes are coming which are larger than normal then they will develop slight slight degree of a little slight degree of macrocytosis what is this macrocytosis this is another evidence of bone marrow compensation their rbcs are slightly larger because freshly made rbc that hot rbc that larger rbc another thing another evidence of bone marrow response is that normally first normal normally i told you reticulocyte are only 1 or 2% most of the red blood cells are mature red blood cell 98 to 99% and they are they are blue uh, sorry mature red blood cells are which color red color is it right but if red blood cells are rapidly destroyed and bone marrow is producing fresh red blood cell with high speed the new red blood cell the reticulocyte which are coming they have a slightly which color bluish, bluish color so if i have severe hemolysis a high percentage of my red blood cells which are coming from the bone marrow right that will be slightly blue shade right so when you look under the microscope at my red blood cells some of them will be totally red and some of them will be reddish blue and we say red blood cells of multiple colors are there blue color and red color blue are the reticulocytes and fresh red blood cells and uh, red are the mature red blood cell and when there are multiple colors and shade we use the term there is polychromasia chrome chrome mean color poly chromasia so what are the evidence of the bone marrow is responding if a patient with has all these evidences here then we say that patient has hemolysis and with all these things he has also increased reticulocyte count plus slight macrocytosis plus polychromasia it means bone marrow is compensating and the last evidence is that you do bone marrow biopsy if you do the bone marrow biopsy what you will find bone marrow will be normal cellular hypercellular or hypocellular hypercellular hyper right in bone marrow cells there will be very abundant cells of the erythroid series lot of normoblasts which are trying to produce red blood cells so we say there will be hypercellular bone marrow hyper cellular bone marrow this is due to erythroid hyperplasia am i clear mm -hmm. no problem now you have done how many things for your patient you have have evidences that patient has hemolysis you have evidences that there is accelerated erythropoiesis now you have to make another decision the patient which you are dealing with of course he has hemolysis and he has increased bone marrow activity you have to look for evidence that hemolysis is extravascular that is within the most of the hemolysis is extravascular that is within the macrophages or it is intravascular hemolysis there are rbcs are breaking within circulation. circulation now let me tell you if there is hemolysis now next question which you are going to answer is yes what is that hemolysis is extra vascular or intra vascular extra vascular mean that hemolysis is going on but is it rbc is breaking down into macrophages or in the circulation very simple if most of the red blood cells are breaking down outside the circulation into macrophages it means macrophages in spleen have to work less or more more when macrophages to work more they undergo work load hyperplasia as you do exercise your muscles size increases but when you put more function on the macrophages and more function on the spleen spleen become larger but that is not that spleen cell become larger their number of the cells become larger 
So what really happens when you keep on bringing more red blood cell to be destroyed by macrophages, macrophages increase their number in supplein and sometimes even in liver. So very classical feature of extravascular hemolysis is supplenomegaly. It's a classical feature of extravascular hemolysis. The spleen of the patient is enlarged, right? So now evidence of extravascular hemolysis. What is the main evidence? Spleno Magali. Is that right? Now, what are the evidences of intravascular hemolysis? If someone has breakdown of red blood cell into general circulation, free hemoglobin will come out. When free hemoglobin will come out, it will immediately bind with heptoglobin. And heptoglobin levels will go down. severely down or free heptoglobin will totally disappear. So first evidence of intravascular hemolysis is, yes, first evidence of intravascular hemolysis is very, very low or totally absent heptoglobin. Is that right? Number two, remember in extravascular hemolysis, heptoglobin may go slightly down. But in intravascular hemolysis, there is a very severe drop in the level of heptoglobin. Are you understanding that? Yes. Great. Now, not only heptoglobin will go down, if there is too much hemolysis, all the heptoglobin is loaded and after that there is further free hemoglobin and no heptoglobin to bind. So hemoglobin will be free in blood. When you can detect free hemoglobin in blood, we say patient has hemoglobinemia. Free hemoglobin is present in circulation. So patient has hemoglobinemia. So patient with absent heptoglobin with a lot of hemoglobinemia, of course it is extravascular hemolysis or intravascular hemolysis? Intravascular hemolysis. You like sounding like a doctor now. Good. Intravascular hemolysis. Then when hemoglobin become free into blood, it may be oxidized. And when it is oxidized, oxidized hemoglobin is called met hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, when it comes out of RBCs, RBCs have special mechanism to keep the hemoglobin in reduced form, right? But when hemoglobin becomes free in the blood, right, it has a tendency to undergo oxi oxidization, right? Oxygenation of hemoglobin is different. Oxidation of hemoglobin is different. And when hemoglobin is oxidized, this is called met hemoglobin. So when there is intravascular hemolysis, met hemoglobin level will go up. up. So there is met hemo, met hemoglobinemia. And then hemoglobin is a tetrameric molecule. You remember I told you in the beginning that hemoglobin is a tetrameric molecule. I'm going to draw one hemoglobin molecule. This is one globin chain, this is other chain, another. These are all four, one hemoglobin molecule. So one hemoglobin molecule is made of four monomers of hemoglobin. It's a tetrameric, uh, tetrameric molecule. As soon as it comes out into circulation, it breaks down into two components. When it breaks down into two components, the hemoglobin molecule breaks down into dimers. It breaks down into dimers. And these dimers are small molecular weight. So hemoglobin molecule, when it becomes free into circulation, it breaks down into dimers. Dimers are small molecules. And these small molecules of hemoglobin dimers, they can easily, they can easily, hemoglobin dimers. They can easily what? Leak into urine. Because they can easily leak into urine, they can filter into Glomeruli, when this hemoglobin dimers are going down, hemoglobin dimer is going down, these cells, what are these cells? Proximal convoluted tubular cells, they love to eat the hemoglobin molecule. They do the process of endocytosis and trap the hemoglobin molecule. They start eating up the hemoglobin molecule by endocytosis. When they take up the hemoglobin molecule, it is highly toxic. It releases the iron and iron destroys the many structures of these proximal convoluted tubular cells. And acute tubular necrosis can occur. There will be sudden rapid acute tubular necrosis can occur. 
acute tubular necrosis we call it atn acute tubular necrosis it's a very important you can say evidence of evidence of what intravascular hemolysis when you have incompatible uh, blood transfusion many red blood cells break down into circulation and lot of hemoglobin go in, goes into these tubules and free hemoglobin is taken up by proximal convoluted tubular cells and they get injured and acute tubular necrosis occur and renal failure can occur if there is a heavy load of hemoglobin it's a toxic molecule thank god normally it is within the rbc membrane is that right so plus so, some of free hemoglobin will appear into urine. urine and we say your patient will have hemoglobin urea what thing will be there hemoglobin urea so what are the evidences of intravascular hemolysis heptoglobin will go down free hemoglobin in the blood will produce hemoglobinemia and met hemoglobinemia there is hemoglobinemia met hemoglobinemia and in the urine there will be hemoglobin urea with evidence of redu redu reducing renal function if there is heavy hemolysis in the blood is it right okay so these are the evidences of which hemolysis intravascular hemolysis what are these evidences extravascular hemolysis now the next question you have to ask that whatever hemolysis is going on in your patient is it acute or chronic is it acute or chronic it is for short duration hemolysis or it's going from long time so we have to decide there is acute hemolysis or chronic hemolysis how to answer that question very simple for example if you have chronic extra vascular hemolysis if you have chronic extra vascular hemolysis is that right it means unconjugated bilirubin is being produced for a long time and this unconjugated bilirubin is chronically going into liver getting conjugated and going down if for many many months and year excessive amount of bilirubin are passing through there they may make bilirubin stones here so just a minute excuse me just repeat it from the beginning we are going to answer that patient has acute or evidence of acute hemolysis or chronic hemolysis i will tell you evidences of chronic hemolysis even hemolysis is going for a long time one evidence of chronic hemolysis is that bilirubin is being produced for very long time so for very long time bilirubin conjugated bilirubin concentration in gall bladder remain high and if in the gall bladder for long time conjugated bilirubin is coming this will make bilirubin stones here and if there are bilirubin stones they are evidence of chronic hemolysis for example if you have a patient who has hemolytic anemia with splenomegaly and gall stones this is evidence a problem is for few days or it's for a long time long time. long time it's a chronic problem is that right yeah. then intravascular hemolysis is it acute or chronic intravascular remember when there is acute intravascular hemolysis there is free hemoglobin here and free hemoglobin in urine, urine. urine. but if intravascular hemolysis is chronic for long long time mild but chronic hemolysis then chronically hemoglobin is coming into these cells then these cells start handling with the hemoglobin what they do they remove these cells let me draw one cell big proximal convoluted tubular if there is chronic intravascular hemolysis hemoglobin is chronically coming here they start removing the iron out of hemoglobin and binding with the apoferritin and producing ferritin and hemosiderin so what happen when there is chronic hemolysis going on especially intravascular hemolysis small amount of hemoglobin is taken by them but if there is very heavy hemolysis these cells will die but if there is small amount they are taking up they start removing the iron and storing it as hemosiderin and then hemosiderin loaded cell will degenerate and come into urine, urine. and hemosiderin loaded cell when they come into urine they can be stained by prussian blue staining method and you can see blue granules of hemosiderin in the these cells and we say patient has hemosiderin in urine 
and when you have hemosiderin in urine, this is called hemosiderin, hemosiderin, yes, urea. urea. So when someone has hemosiderin urea, it means hemolysis is acute or chronic? Chronic. 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 Because to produce hemosiderin here, it takes long, long, long time. Is that right? Any question here? Now, let me ask you a few questions. Little test. If a patient has severe hemolysis going on, if a patient has severe hemolysis going on, what are the evidences of hemolysis? Number one, yes. Unconjugated bilirubin level will go up. Is that right? It will be cold uric jaundice or a cold uric jaundice? A cold uric jaundice because this is not going into urine. Then urobilinogen level in the urine will go up. And if there is severe hemolysis, urobilinogen level in the urine will go up. Which enzyme level in the blood will go up? Which enzyme is released by the hemolysis? LDH. Is that right? LDH level in the blood will go up. And which protein in the blood level will go down? Heptoglobin. That's right. If I say there is evidence of accelerated Erythropoiesis, bone marrow will become hypocellular or hypercellular? Hypercellular. Okay. Then uh, there will be slight microcytosis or macrocytosis? Macrocytosis. macrocytosis? There will be monochromia or polychromia? Polychromia. And there is increased reticulocyte count or decreased reticulocyte count? Increased. increased reticulocyte count. That's very good. These are the evidence of accelerated erythropoiesis. Now, if we have to look for that hemolysis is extravascular or intravascular hemolysis, if hemolysis is occurring in reticular endothelial cells or macrophages, it is which type of hemolysis? Extra. Extra. And if it is occurring into blood circulation, intravascular. If a patient with hemolytic anemia hence had splenomegaly and gallbladder pigment stones, bilirubin stone, it is evidence of chronic, chronic? chronic. extravascular hemolysis. And if someone has in the blood Hemoglobinemia, metahemoglobinemia, no heptoglobin. This is all evidence of intravascular hemolysis. This is all evidence of intravascular hemolysis. And if there is also, if patient has in the urine only free hemoglobin but no hemosiderin, it is acute intravascular hemolysis. But if a patient has in the urine hemoglobin plus hemosiderin urea, then it is acute or chronic, chronic, then it is chronic, chronic, chronic hemoglobin. intravascular hemolysis. hemolysis. That's right. Any question here? So this was an introduction to the hemolytic anemias. Yes, please. I have a question. Yes, what's your question? You mentioned something concerning the aptoglobin, the hemoglobin complex that is destroyed by what? Macrophages. Macrophages. Yeah, in the liver and other areas. Macrophages have receptor for heptoglobin also. Right? Okay. So, but the, those receptors of macrophages only bind with that heptoglobin which is complex with hemoglobin. Is that right? This is, nature has provided an extra way to remove the hemoglobin rapidly from circulation. Right? Any question? Class dismissed.